Hello and welcome to the Evolving HubSpot podcast by Hubble Digital, a podcast where we explore the topics that matter the most in the world of HubSpot. I'm Matthew Creswick, and in this episode, I'm joined by not one, not two, but three of Hubble's best minds to talk about HubSpot predictions for 2024. First of all, joining us on the call is Darren Smith, CEO of Hubble and frequent guest on the Evolving HubSpot podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Darren. Thank you, Matt. Good to be back. Awesome stuff. Secondly, Maria, also appearing for the second time on the Evolving HubSpot podcast. Maria, welcome. Thank you very much for having me again. And lastly, a first timer on the Evolving HubSpot podcast, we have Carl joining us from Germany. Carl, you're currently based? I'm currently based in Leipzig, Germany, but I am from the US, so you won't expect the average German accent from me. Um, But yeah, long time listener, first time caller. Thanks. Awesome stuff. In the nature of everything Hubble, it's true international because we have Darren in Cape Town and Maria, usually based in Aberdeen, but currently visiting our Belgium office in Brussels. Maria, is that right? Yes, that is correct. I'm in Brussels at the moment and I am Greek living in Scotland <laughs> working for a global organization. So very international indeed. Well, I feel incredibly boring because I'm I'm British and currently sat just outside London, which is extremely normal for this call. But but thank you all for joining. We are here today on the podcast to talk about HubSpot predictions for 2024. And maybe to set the context, uh, Maria joining us on the podcast works on our marketing consulting team. Carl joining us on the podcast works on our sales consulting team. And Darren, our, our SEO, is a, is a a long time kind of member of the HubSpot advisory committee and has a good view on all HubSpot tools. Um, So we will hopefully have a good view on on various aspects of HubSpot and various tools today. But maybe to kick things off, we can review and spend a little bit of time just talking about where HubSpot have made improvements and what they've been focusing on in 2023. This year, we've seen a ton of product updates, features um, throughout the whole year, not just around the inbound event. But yeah, maybe we can start with you from a from a marketing point of view. Where has HubSpot been focusing over the last few months? Sure. I mean, as expected uh, from the industry trend that we've been seeing around AI, a lot of the new features that we got in HubSpot were around AI. So we saw a lot of AI features around content generation, social media posts, blog support. We even got an AI chatbot that we've been exploring. So there's been a heavy focus on that on to be able to do their work more efficiently to get not necessarily maybe replace what they've been doing, but even spark that creativity and give them ideas about new content that they could be writing about. So that was one of the areas that we saw a huge focus. And obviously, as I said, it makes sense based on what we're um, seeing the industry in general. Other interesting tools that have come out as well, we saw the introduction of SMS now for the first time in HubSpot and a heavier focus on WhatsApp. The SMS ability to be able to send text messages through HubSpot and to be able to automate that is something new. Obviously, we know emails have been, I would say, the the primary channel in the marketing world for many years now. But as people are maybe getting a little bit tired of that, we want a shorter, more, a a different way to communicate with them. We see that now with that introduction. I think a lot of companies are going to start to play with these tools and start adopting new channels. The SMS is now available in, in the US for now, but there are plans, obviously, to roll that out globally as well. We also saw some interesting updates on customer journey analytics. And again, I've said that last time as well, reporting is the foundation to everything we do. It's super important to not just be running these campaigns aimlessly and not looking at the data. So now giving us that ability to visualize the funnel and see which steps are our users taking before they get to conversion can really help us further optimize our campaigns. And the last thing we saw in marketing that I feel like was quite a heavy focus again from HubSpot was around collaboration. So we saw a lot of changes and new features coming out in terms of approvals, in terms of permissions, in terms of commenting on assets, getting that internal collaboration, because not every team has additional tools that they use outside of HubSpot to be able to not only maybe project manage or discuss these things or be able, again, to approve an asset before um, something gets published. So we did see a lot of changes on that. 
Um, and it's all been very exciting. And, and I look forward to seeing what else is going to come. Cool. Good stuff. And, and I think maybe today we'll try and count how many times AI is referenced in a recent and future product <laughs> update. But Carl, maybe throwing it over to you then. So from a sales perspective, um, Maria's obviously covered kind of the main marketing hub focus for the last few months and, and over 2023. What about the sales side of things? This year has been massive in regards to what HubSpot has done in the sales space. I mean, they've basically, as they described it in at Inbound this year, they've basically relaunched the sales hub. Um, and it's the software as a platform. It's completely grown up in a lot of ways. I think most significantly, we see this with the new leads tool. And that's a fundamental way of rethinking how, I mean, this is such a major change for HubSpot because it really changes that handover from marketing to sales, which are two of the most major components of HubSpot and how we're speak, how sales is going to prospect, how they're going to speak to new sales or potential sales and how that whole system and giving you a whole lot more customization there. And then there's been just so many small changes on the sides that have huge impacts. I mean, just this new beta that's coming out with deal rules, for instance, so that for the first time you can set things up where you can say, when you create a new deal, it always has to go into this deal stage. Or given this circumstance, you have to um, always put it into this deal stage. Some functionality that I think a lot of people have been waiting for and are really excited about. And so the whole sales hub, there's so many little things, but overall the feeling is like, okay, sales hub is grown up. And it is ready to handle every size organization from the small startup to a full enterprise is ready to get going on sales hub. Amazing. And, and Carl, you obviously referenced the, the fact that HubSpot have, in inverted commas, relaunched sales hub. And, and I guess from your perspective, what, what does that tell us about the kind of the updates? For me, you know, it kind of focuses on the idea that they haven't just added some new updates and features and tools. They almost are treating it as like a new product launch. Is that fair? Well, what I think the biggest thing that I'm noticing just generally is that there has been a perception for a while that HubSpot is a marketing platform that could also do sales. And I think the point of the updates this year were to say, no, 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 it is a marketing and sales platform, full stop. And that there's no reason that you have to think, okay, I've got my marketing platform and let me go find another sales platform that you can really look at HubSpot much more as a holistic software. And we're seeing that not just in sales, but we're seeing that, for instance, in the updates in the commerce hub. So we're going to look at more things in e-commerce. We're going to look at things running elements of the business, like invoicing that maybe previously had to run in a different system. So I think the overall change from a business strategy and what the software can do is just saying, hey, HubSpot is now your end-to-end -end solution for a lot of different applications. It's no longer just this specialized tool for marketing. Here's everything it can do. And have you thought about that? Hey, we can just do that in HubSpot. And so maybe coming to you, Darren, so Maria's spoken about marketing tools. Carl has obviously referenced about sales tools and, and lent on the idea that HubSpot more than ever can be used as this platform for kind of end-to-end -end customer solutions. So how do we attract, how do we bring in leads? How do we convert them into, you know, long lasting sales? But then one step further, how do you actually turn that, you know, a customer service support, ongoing upsell, cross-sell, renewal, subscriptions, this kind of thing. So I guess, Darren, your, your view on 2023 as more of a kind of, you know, a, a holistic view on, on, on HubSpot as a CRM platform. Yeah, so I think to add, no one's spoken about Service Hub yet, but Service Hub was also pretty much relaunched. And I think where before there were certain features that were table stakes that were missing, they're there now. Um, I don't, like I, I just want, I wanted to call that out, but but overall, I think for me the the biggest trend or biggest kind of improvement or change was very very subtle. And I think that we're going to start seeing the impact of that in, kind of in 2024. And that change is that uh, the base CRM became its own hub. It, it was subtly announced at, at Inbound with the smart CRM. And from what I can see, I think there are some uh, trials going on where people can buy the CRM without sales, without marketing, without service. And so what does that mean? That means that 
HubSpot is competing in the CDP market. Um, uh, and it, it does make sense. I mean, like so many other forms uh, will have multiple different databases where with HubSpot, it's a single database. You can sync very easily, for, whether it's from a complex accounting platform or ERP platform like SAP, or whether you sync in from a uh, kind of a Microsoft Dynamics type kind of platform, which isn't very user friendly, but is there because IT wants it there or whatever. Like you know, it's very easy to get information into HubSpot and make that your central hub. And once you've got that, then you are empowered. And when I say empowered, the, the, what they did with each of the hubs is they renamed them very subtly as well. It's the sales engagement hub, the marketing engagement hub, or the service engagement hub, right? So once you've got all your data, how are you going to use that data to engage prospects or seeing customers and, and with what set of tools? So I think that's going to be a big thing that we see carry on through into 2024 and a very, very subtle uh, launch that happened at Inbound this year. Good stuff. And I think, Darren, you touched on it then, but I, I think maybe you can talk out the idea that in previous years, we've seen you know HubSpot use their annual conference Inbound in Boston as their kind of obviously their flagship event, but at their time of year where they do their huge announcements and you know new hubs are launched, new products are launched. And I think maybe more than ever this year, we actually saw less of a huge bang in terms of like a new large product launch or something like that. And more of the smaller kind of iterative, you know, really core things that have been updated throughout the year more, more than ever this year. Do you see that come true? And, and I guess, do you, do you see that being something we see more of in the future from HubSpot? Yeah, look, HubSpot at the moment, at a very minimum, are making around 30 launches a month uh, across the different hubs. Now, obviously, us being a HubSpot partner, we notice those launches and we start using those things. So maybe, yeah, when we get to inbound and they announce things, you know, it's old news, we've tried it, uh, we're using it and so on. But for many companies, that's the moment where they, they actually find a, out about these kind of new features. So maybe for them, it feels like a bigger, a bigger thing. But I think what we've seen is HubSpot's, you know, product development team has grown significantly. Um, I think one of the other things to reflect on is, is they publish their product roadmap every year at HubSpot.com forward slash new. And they, everything that was on that roadmap in January was launched as well as all the AI features, which weren't on the product roadmap in, in, in January when they initially published it. So there's there's been a huge amount, and I think that volume is going to continue. There's a, you know, there's a lot of uh, technology uh, competition, to technology racing going on at the moment. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I think there's going to be constant kind of features launched. And I think that that, that shows innovation. Uh, it shows thought leadership. For customers, it does come with, I suppose, you've got that, I always say never try to build your own CRM because you miss out on basically 30 product launches a, a, a month. But, you know, with that comes risk as well. And that's what we see with a lot of our customers is they self-discover these new features, these new tools, and they start using them with no governance, no consideration to how is this going to scale? What happens if I'm an organization of 500 people and all 500 start using this new tool without any consideration on how we're going to report on it and all that type of thing? And that's what we see in happening all the time. So as much as HubSpot's innovating, which is amazing, it also comes with risk. And Maria, flipping over to you, I guess, firstly, how are you and your team coping with 30 new updates and <laughs> feature updates in the product per month with working with clients each and every day? But also, from a marketing hub point of view, being one of the core hubs in, in the platform, if we think about 2024 and kind of what you expect, you know, the, what are you expecting HubSpot to be launching it inbound next year? What are those kind of products? Um, not, maybe not the specific products updates, but the trends and patterns that you're expecting to see. Just to answer your, your first question about how we deal with this, this is why I love Hubble so much. And, and this is not like me trying to promote it, but it is part of our culture. Learning is a fundamental principle that we have as a team. So looking at these updates, we don't look at it and get intimidated. On the contrary, we look at it and get excited and start thinking about, okay, how can our clients leverage these tools? And again, as I said to you last time, we don't do it just for the sake of it. It needs to make sense for the client. So this is why I said, even the AI tools, if you don't feel confident right now, if you don't feel like you could get a value out of them, 
you don't have to use them. It has to answer your why's and it has to fit with your strategy and overall goals. And this is the attitude that the team has. So we're always trying to stay ahead of the curve, obviously, as, a, as an elite partner as well. We do get, you know, sometimes a heads up from um, the HubSpot marketing teams about what's coming out. And we always try to be thoughtful again about how we apply this knowledge and these, and these tools. In regards to your second question about what I think is going to happen next year, I'm actually quite excited to see. I know a lot of people are worried about the new privacy legislation and, you know, the death of the third party cookies and how that's going to be affecting our marketing strategies. But I actually think that is going to lead to a resurgence of inbound because we're going to be relying a lot on first party data that you have to creatively find a way to capture that data directly from your audiences. So I think that's going to push a lot of people to start thinking again, outside of the box, start looking again at their target audiences. We see it so many times over and over again, we work with clients and when they say we've got a strategy and then you look at, you know, who is their audience and they don't have that well developed, they don't really know, or they have very basic information and they just look at some general demographic data. So really working on your target audiences, understanding your personas and trying to capture that first party data is going to be a game changer because that also means that you would try to capture that as early on as possible to then nurture them through your automation, through your lead nurture campaigns to get them to convert. But the goal is going to change from simply capturing someone at the end of the journey to capturing them as early as possible to control that narrative. I think that's going to be a game changer. Obviously, AI is still going to be around. As I said to you last time, I don't think it's a revolution yet, but we are scratching the surface of that. And I think we're going to move from what I call the exploration phase to actually application. Uh, minimum, maybe some reluctancy there, maybe not a ton, but even with the latest updates that we had from OpenAI with the ability now to create your own GPT that serves a function and train that. I think a lot of companies, again, will have to think creatively as to how they can use them. And I look forward to seeing those ideas and seeing what people come up with. Cool. Yes, absolutely. The ever moving space of kind of uh, open AI, chat GPT, and, and, you know, I think how that is used further than you purely opening a tab and logging into chat GPT. PT for me is kind of a very interesting space and, in, you know, how people start to really integrate it into a website or into a chat platform or something like that. So, okay, cool. Thank you, Maria. I guess, Carl, moving on to you from a sales perspective, what do you predict in the next kind of 12 months, you know, inbound next year, what are you, you thinking HubSpot might be focusing on? So I think the big focus is going to be on efficiency and utilizing these tools. And again, as Maria said, we're getting into the, that implementation, that application phase where we're seeing a lot more AI tools at the fingertips of salespeople, but also intelligently integrated into your process. And so one thing that I think is great about all these HubSpot features is that we, especially at Hubble, we take the time to think, okay, where does this work in this process? I mean, I can't tell you how many times in the past three months we've been like, okay, we have everything mapped out, but here's this new thing. How do we integrate this? Like, and, and we kind of got to go back to the drawing board, but I love that we do that and we're, we're transparent and we say like, there's this new, this new feature. I think it's a much better way of doing it, but we have to integrate this and we have to think about this. I mean, we're seeing AI was a much bigger focus, I would say on the marketing side. There's some things on the sales side, for instance, creating uh, the the sales emails for instance was a really cool functionality but we want to see it go further especially in multilingual formats i think that's something that i've really wanted to see for instance so i work in germany but i'm an english speaker and you know we might have someone who's a sales rep who speaks three different languages but in HubSpot right now, you can only set it to one language to use those AI tools. So I think it will be really cool to see that evolve where you can go, okay, I want to send this email. I need a sales email AI generated in Spanish, in French, in German. You know, give me that all very quickly and, and give me those tools and have them all at my fingertips. I think you're going to see the core functionality that we've had preview implemented and have huge impacts with small changes and small impacts there having big impacts. Cool. Good stuff. As you referenced, kind of things like the the new deal rules, you know, the lead object coming in and, and kind of being 
transparent. We, as you said, we're constantly looking at this stuff. We're going through a process at the moment at Hubble where we're kind of re-architecting our own CRM system and, you know, how we use HubSpot for, for ourselves and the ability to keep up with new products, test them, you know, is, is, is tough and challenging, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're, we're in a good place to test those so that we can pass those learnings on to client and prospects and the like. So it's a good place to be. So I guess that maybe it's kind of round up the 2024 predictions with your set again, kind of less of a, maybe a marketing focus or a sales focus, more of a ecosystem kind of full platform and end-to-end solutions where do you see hubspot focusing over the next 12 months so i think you know we did have a dedicated podcast on uh, them acquiring clearbit and so i think we will start seeing uh, changes to their platform incorporating clearbit towards the end of 2024 because they will rebuild it they're not like the other crms that will just keep it as a side tool that you need to subscribe to. Um, so that's that's one thing. And Clearbit's obviously all about data enrichment, intent data, that type of thing. So I think we'll see that across both sales, service, and marketing. Um, you know, think of uh, intent data is currently largely used um, from a sales perspective um, and maybe a marketing perspective. But uh, imagine being able to use that to anticipate customer churn and customer problems or if the customer is unhappy with how your tool or product or service is working and they're currently looking for alternatives so i think they'll be able to incorporate that across uh, across the hubs overall you know i think one of hubspot's biggest challenges as a company is that they target both the startup the small business and all the way up into the mid mid market and you know there's obviously major benefits of that like so many people that uh, many companies will start as a startup uh, using something like zoho or something like that like a small business crm um, and as they get bigger they need to uh, pay that tech debt and graduate to another crm and all the expenses that go with rebuilding integrations and all that type of thing now with hubspot you don't have to worry about that you can be a startup and you can go all the way up and we've got customers with thousands and thousands of users and millions of contacts and that type of thing it can handle that but yeah you know, i think the the there's obviously specific features that uh companies want to use in sales and service and marketing those are features that are attractive to all different segments but the one area that you know we focus on is the mid market and i think that hubspot has made massive improvements um to security and permissioning and customization uh, in particular, in 2023, you've got the UI React interfaces that you can build complete custom features in there. You've got uh, field level permissions, that type of thing. But it still needs further improvements. Uh, I think Maria referenced kind of European laws, which are becoming even more complex, where at the moment, HubSpot allows you to put your data in America or in Germany. That's not sufficient for most mid-market organizations. In fact, most mid-market organizations want their Italian data in Italy, their French data in France, their UK data in the UK, but still operating from one portal. So that's a big, I don't think HubSpot's gonna get there in 2024, but I think there's going to be uh, incremental improvements on security and permissioning so that it can kind of even more appeal and be even more scalable. Because as I said, you can go from small business up to mid-market but if you go beyond mid-market into full enterprise often there are those are the features it's not the functionality that's missing it's actually just the security and permissioning type features that are missing that prevent you from from doing that all right well to to thank you darren and, and to to maybe bring this kind of in, into a wrap into a full circle we are early first week of december we're recording this podcast at the moment carl maria and myself are sitting in jumpers in Germany, Belgium and London, very cold and wintry. Darren is in a t-shirt and I can imagine shorts and flip-flops in 32 degrees in, in Cape Town. But with the with the Christmas period coming up, it, it being kind of the, the season for giving, I have a question for each of you. If HubSpot could give each of you one present in the form of a tool, a feature, an update or, or a focus for, for next year, uh, what, what would that be? And let's go, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Maria, Carl and, and finish with Darren. Interesting question, I would have to say. Uh, maybe it doesn't fit with the trends that we've discussed so far, but it is a personal love of mine. So I'm going to mention it just in hopes that at some point it will happen. 
but I have a tremendous love for programmable emails. And obviously when we talk about hyper-personalization, you know, more dynamic content, I think programmable emails can give that to the customer. So for those who don't know, let's think about a real estate agency, for example, and Maria being a, a contact that's interested in purchasing a, a property, I will have certain variables and interests, right? So maybe I will want a, a certain number of bedrooms, certain locations, but it can be multiple different combinations with programmable emails because we're able to dynamically pull that content and create a unique version, completely unique to Maria. It is such a powerful feature, but at the moment, I don't feel like HubSpot has focused a lot on that to try and improve it, especially around reporting. When we talk about this with customers, they, they always show an interest in this, especially enterprise clients who, again, are speaking to audiences who have multiple combinations of interests. I would love to see some more work on that. And as I said, especially around the reporting, being able to see how many of these unique versions you're creating. I think that could give us some really nice insights that could feed back into the campaigns and help us improve those better. So that would be my wish. If anyone is listening at HubSpot, please let's make it happen. <laughs> and Carl? For me, also in, re in regards to reporting would definitely be around the whole topic of revenue reporting is something that keeps coming up a lot is, you know, HubSpot is really good at getting your deal closed. But when it comes to things like forecasting recurring revenue and saying that, you know, when I have a sales manager that says, well, how much are we going to bill in April of next year? And so you have to set that up. There's a lot of ways to do this and move around. And generally that ends up getting either pushed into a finance system or into an ERP, but the data is there in HubSpot and especially with the enhancements and the improvements and payments and invoicing uh, with Commerce Hub, I think it would be fantastic to sort of set up, okay, I've got a 12 month contract it's shifting. We have start dates. Where that? Where is that revenue going to come in? And have that all be built into HubSpot would be such a fantastic thing and something that I see a lot of clients asking for. I think Hubble would be really happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. And Darren, to 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 round us up. Well. I'm going to have to give you two because Cole reminds me of one that I, I really have been hoping for for a long time. And it, 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 it's very similar to what he said, but I suppose it, it relates directly to the forecasting tool. So at the moment, you can forecast by pipeline. That was a new feature before you could only do an, an overall for, forecast. But companies have advanced forecasting requirements. They forecast by product sometimes. So each salesperson has to sell two of these products or ten thousand dollars worth of this product sometimes it's a monthly amount sometimes that's quarterly sometimes that's annual amount sometimes it's by team by region by pipeline and a combination of, of all of those so i think the forecasting tool needs a lot more flexibility but the other one which is my biggest wish is is related to what i was saying earlier but in particular around the business units functionality so business units is pretty average right now like, and we've got so many customers with, uh, that need multiple different subscription centers, uh, you know, business units and, and unsubscribes and that type of thing need to appeal or work for sales driven emails, not just marketing emails. Um, sometimes business units need to be grouped, right? So, uh, you might have a, a company with five divisions, two of those divisions are selling to the same persona, or maybe you're looking at conferences and a conference organized organizer that has multiple different conferences and you need to be able to have subscription centers and that type of thing for them. So business units is like a, it doesn't perform great. It's quite expensive for what you get. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, in light of what I was saying about security and permissioning, if they could just fix that, that would go a long way. Cool. Good stuff. And, and I can just, see Maria just... is equally hopeful of, of that in the new year, right? I fully agree. I almost want to change my wish now and, and go with what Darren said about the business units. Because it's, again, when we're talking about enterprise clients and having multiple teams, it's so important. And we have found a way to um, offer these kind of things to the clients, like the multiple subscription centers, right? We have developed custom subscription pages and, you know, custom footers um, to be able to give that functionality to clients. But I just don't think it's the best use of our resources and the time where we could be doing so much more. And as 
Darren said, the expectations of the clients as well when they purchase these quite expensive feature are a lot higher. And I think right now the delivery of the functionality just doesn't match the value. So I look forward to seeing that improve as well. I see currently is too. <laughs> yeah. I, one thing, uh, Darren also reminded me if uh, another thing I think that could be, would be fantastic is that product level reporting um, right now, it doesn't work for instance, across currencies. So if you want to see how much total revenue have we made from selling product A, you can only see that in one currency at a time. And I think it's a simple fix to make that change. And that could really improve the, the quality of the reporting. All right. Good stuff. Well, look, we'll bring that to a wrap. Thank you all for joining. I look forward to touching base with you all next year. You know, maybe in 12 months time, we can do a recap as to what came true and, and which of your Christmas wishes are still kind of outstanding. We'll have to fire them over to the HubSpot product team. But I guess, first of all, Maria, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And again, Merry Christmas to everyone as well. And fingers crossed, we get all our wishes. <laughs> fingers crossed. Carl, thank you. First time we're on the, the Evolving HubSpot podcast. Thank you for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. And Darren, lastly, yourself. Thank you as, as always. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and likewise, hope everybody has a good end of year. And I am sure we will all be back speaking to you again next year, Matt. Absolutely, I look forward to it. And as echoed for everyone, we wish everyone a happy and safe and healthy period and we'll be in touch in the new year. Thank you all.